Greetings, my name is Emir Vikvusson, welcome to my channel. I want to tell you about something called Rohammer Attacks, which is an attack that's brewing on the internet. Effectively, I'm going to tell you a tale of this hacker guy who is going to use JavaScript to take over your computer. And when I say computer, I might as well mean phone, because everything now is a computer. What's interesting about this part is that it's not just taking over your computer like a regular JavaScript, but it's taking a computer without using any software bugs and without using any social engineering to fool you into clicking something. This is something that's the straight dope. So let me go all the way back to the beginning. I'm going to give you a simplified view of how your computer works. So I'm going to gloss over a lot of details. I just want to give you a sense, high level sense for what these types of attacks are. So in your computer, you have a bunch of different parts. You have your input output system, like your mouse and your smartphone or your keyboard, your display. And then you have a CPU that you're doing on the computer and you have various kinds of memory. And there can be slow kinds of memory like your hard disk or your SSD. And there can be your internal memory called DRAM or RAM. Let's imagine that we're loading up a program. So what happens is that your program gets loaded from your hard disk, it gets processed by the CPU, part of it stays in memory, and then there's going to be a lot of transactions going back and forth between the CPU and the memory. And that's your program running, and ultimately it's going to generate something that's going to provide you back on the display or, or do something, have some side effects. All right. So if we just focus on this part here, the memory and CPU, what's effectively happening is that all your different applications are going to be running on your computer, and the CPU is trying to switch between them. And in doing so, it stores part of what it's doing with each of its programs in the internal memory, in the DRAM. All right? So your operating system itself is also using that memory to store its own code and its own data. And that's the key point here, is that we both have programming instructions and data interleaved. So all your data lives in memory adjacent to all the stuff that the different programs are using, like the tabs of your browser or the PDF document that's open in your PDF reader. All that stuff is in memory, as well as all the important data that's being used by your operating system, like knowing what user there is running right now, knowing what kind of privileges different programs have or, or how long it's been up. And the way memory works, if you look at what DRAM actually stands for, it's random access memory. Which means that things are interleaved in very odd ways. Uh, you have your neighbor of your memory cell could be a completely different program. In fact, your data could be adjacent to something that the operating system is using. Okay, by and large, we don't particularly care about that. Suppose that you're coming out and you're supposed to design memory. So what would be the natural approach of doing so? Well, you might think, okay, I need to store a bunch of things. And the way we store things in computers is in bits. We use digital representation of data. And bits here means that we would like to have just like a long array here of tiny little cells. And in DRAM, this is, uh, each cell is one transistor and one capacitor. And if there's high charge in the capacitor, it should mean that the bit is effectively one instead of a zero. That's what we would like, right? Um, and with this, we can encode any instruction in any program and any uh, type of media that we want to store, any type of data. Just zeros and ones, right? So that's what you'd like memory to look like. Unfortunately, we can't really just make it into one giant continuous strand of bits. That wouldn't work physically. So this approach doesn't quite work. But something very close to it actually does work. So what actually goes on inside your, inside your memory cell is that we've arranged these bits into effectively a matrix. So you have this grid of different memory cells. Now, of course, there are actually several such cells. It's almost three-dimensional, and there are various aspects I'm glossing over. But you can think about it this way, that if you want to retrieve information from one bit in memory, what will happen by your DRAM is that it's going to retrieve an entire row of the bits that are adjacent to the one that you want. So that gets that row, and it puts it into something called a buffer, which is just the way it retrieves information. So it funnels it out to a buffer. Okay, And now, You've gotten these, in this case here, eight bits, and uh, you can look up the one bit that you that you wanted to know about. All right, so that's memory in a nutshell. Another thing I want to tell you about is that DRAM, the D part of DRAM means dynamic. And the dynamic part refers to the fact that when you 
put some charge into a capacitor, it starts to fade away over time. It doesn't stay. This is why when you turn off your computer, all the things that are in your DRAM will ultimately get wiped really fast after sharing off your computer. Whereas like your hard disk or your SSD, they have special properties that allow these bits to stay, which is why they're persistent, they're durable memories. So in DRAM, in order to be able to operate while the computer is running, these capacitors, the charge in them gets refreshed, refreshed. And every 64 milliseconds or whatever recharge rate you have on your DRAM, all of them become refreshed. So that's what this animation here is showing. OK, so that's just one more tidbit I wanted to bring into it. Now let's talk back about these uh, things that can go wrong. So suppose that there's this row here. It's in green. And for whatever reason, there's somebody who is continuously retrieving that row of memory. Normally, this doesn't happen because when you retrieve something from memory, it gets stored in an even faster, tiny memory called a cache. And there are actually various layers of cache where you can store memory. But suppose that for some freak accident, this one row of memory just gets hammered. Well, what will happen? Well, in retrieving the data from this row, what can actually happen is that the information leaks to other adjacent rows. That's a bit of a simplification. But effectively, what can happen is that because you're draining some of the the charge from that particular row, the charge from the adjacent cells can get depleted, and so one, some of the bits can flip around. And in flipping a bit, this bit could actually be pretty important. Just to summarize, repeatedly seeking the same memory row can leak bits to adjacent memory lines. We've now explained a row hammer attack. That bit, the reason why this is important, is because suppose that this green row here is owned by Firefox. Firefox is a, is a tab that's running, and it's using memory, and this is a part of that memory. Now, it happens to be adjacent to a row that's used by the operating system itself. And in particular, it could be a part of the operating system that pertains to permissions. For instance, you might say something like, hey, this bit that got flipped here is actually the bit that says, does this program X here have administrative privileges? Now, in giving a program administrative privileges, it suddenly can access bigger parts of your, of your computer. Understand that your browser and your tabs and the scripts inside your PDF and so forth, they're all code that's running on your computer. But they're, the attempt is that they're sandboxed away from the rest of the computer in the sense that they can't access your files. They can't access your peripheral devices. They can't change stuff. They're just in this little environment where they can hardly do anything. But those controls are dictated by operating system or by the programs that are running them. And little bits like this can flip those permissions. So now you should be starting to be a little bit more suspicious. Wait, this is actually bad. Flipping one bit might take over a program. So there's some potency to this attack, this repeated fetching of a memory row. Flipping one bit can actually be pretty dangerous. Now let's, uh, let's think about that for a second. And the way you should approach this is like, wait, hmm, I'm supposed to be skeptical. So the skeptic in you should ask questions like, hey, wait a second, isn't this rare? Isn't this something that should only happen like once in a blue moon? Well, it used to be true. So let me show you a graph. And the graph I'm going to show you is going to show you how often you get errors when you make 1 billion axes. And on the x-axis, I'm going to show you the different DRAM versions we have over time. So here we see the vintage of the module in the x-axis. So you can see that 2008 and 2009, there really were not too many errors when per billion cells. Now, the three colors here pertain to modules from three different companies. But all of a sudden, in 2010, we start to see hundreds of errors per cell. And then it goes worse. In 2011, we start to see uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of errors per 1 billion axes. So we're saying that one in every 1,000 slams of memory cells like that are producing bit flips. That's really bad. And suddenly, all of these different DRAMs are having this type of an issue. Now, what's going on? Well, what's going on is that the device makers of the RAM have intense pressure to be able to produce memory that is big, so moving from 
one gigabyte to two gigabytes to eight gigabytes to 16 gigabytes and so forth. It means that you're trying to make the cells themselves, the cells that we drew up earlier, denser and denser. And we have reached physical limitations now in that there's simply noise. There's simply much easier movement of charge between different cells can happen right now when you slam these very dense DRAMs than could be before. We've reached limits right now. Now, the hardware industry has been aware of this, but they didn't really think that this was a big concern until recently. And it was shown that this can actually be a problem, which is the second question that you should be asking. So we've established that this is actually a pretty common problem. Over 85% of DRAM that's been produced since 2011, including almost all of DDR3 and some of the DDR2 cells, are vulnerable to raw memory. Now, I should caveat that DDR4, there's a proposal that makes memory immune, which is that when you repeatedly hit a particular memory cell, you refresh the capacitors on the adjacent cells, therefore making this harder to exploit. We'll get back to that. So the second question you should be asking is, wait a minute, if it's not rare, but isn't it then incredibly hard to exploit? And that's where the hardware industry was like, well, this must be really rare, and, and even if you can do it, what's the harm? So let me just show you what can happen. So here's your memory again. And here's a box of memory that are owned by Firefox. These are tabs right now. And something that you can do if you're a JavaScript code, suppose you're just on any website and you're running JavaScript code running the website, JavaScript can ask for more memory. In fact, that's what JavaScript does a lot of, is asking for memory. So you might have a whole bunch of cells that are dedicated to JavaScript. And if you're careful, you can allocate these pages so that you have so many of them that you've effectively exhausted the memory of the computer, or at least of the process. This means that you can now force the computer into saying, hey, I want to now obtain information about the security properties of my tab. And the program, Firefox in this case, has to scramble and be like, oh, I need to find uh, memory to be able to store this information. And it might end up right between those cells that you control, these blue cells or these green cells. And that's pretty dangerous because a bit here might now mean, hey, instead of this being uh, admin privileges, it's simply, can I talk to the operating system? Do I have permissions to do certain things to the outside of my, uh, my sandbox? Can I talk to other programs? Can I see files? Little bits like that can dictate those types of properties. It's a simplification, but effectively true. Here is a demo, or the output of a demo that one of my students ran on a program called Drammer that was created by folks at Free University in Holland. And let me just zoom in here and show you. This is on his phone. They hammered a bunch of memory, three megabytes of memory, and they found a whole bunch of flips. They were seeing 92 flips that happened during that. In fact, it took 109 seconds before they found a flip that was not just flipping from one to zero, but actually exploitable in the sense that it was affecting parts of the operating system page tables, we're getting very detailed right now, that allowed you to refer to some other page and say claim that you had ownership. So 2.17% of the flips that, that were found were exploitable. And this happened in 287 seconds. Now the people who ran this experiment here, the people who ran this study, looked at a whole bunch of phones, recent phones, smartphones. And they found that they were able to attack and completely own your phone, meaning that they had complete takeover of your smartphone from a JavaScript vantage point in about 15 to 30 seconds. Think about that for a second. This means that JavaScript, something that's running on a web page that you're opening up, is doing nothing illegal, nothing that's not allowed from within JavaScript, just allocating memory and hammering particular addresses repeatedly, is able to take over your entire smartphone in 15 to 30 seconds without you being any wiser. This is pretty huge. Here's a demo. If you click the link, you'll see a demo by researchers at Free University showing how a very recent Android 6.0.1 phone can be jailbroken using this technique, which is 
pretty remarkable because you're hacking an entire device, all the different layers of software, by using an extremely low-level primitive, which is this row hammer attack. And this demo demonstrates how all of these steps can be automated through a regular SSH connection to the phone. So if you're interested, uh, check that out. The question now becomes, how do we defend up against these types of attacks? And this is arguably where things go a little bit sour because we don't really have good solutions. Now, one of the solutions that we do have is that we could have something called ECC memory. ECC stands for error correcting codes. It means that a few of the bits that you use for internal memory are being allocated as if it checks them. It's saying, hey, something wrong happened right here. We were getting a bit flip. The, there was not supposed to be a bit flip. And ECC memory goes even further and says, I think I can correct what that bit flip was. Which means that if you're an attacker and you're flipping bits, those things can get corrected by the memory cells themselves. This is very promising. Of course, there are many, many DRAMs and phones and so forth that don't have ECC. And a study also showed that a lot of ECC RAM is actually not as effective as advertised. They're unable to defend against some of the bit flips if there's two or more, it is completely ineffective. And there's an attack that not just tries to leak data from one green cell to the adjacent cells, but from two green cells surrounding the particular target row that you're trying to attack, leaking information from both sides, called a double-sided row hammer attack. And that ECC memory can do much about. It's a partial solution. Another thing is that you could monitor the entire system and say, hey, I want to see every access that is made here. In effect, monitoring every memory access that there is on your phone or in your computer and so forth is extremely expensive. There are ways in which you can optimize it. So some people have been making progress on that and making this more efficient. But it is still a pretty high burden to pay to monitor all the different memory access that are made. And most of these types of attacks, they do make it harder to exploit these types of attacks, but they do not make them impossible. And so they are just a part of this cat and mouse game. And the third thing is that we could think about, well, what about this refresh rate? So the refresh rate really saves us. We can say instead of refreshing memory every 64 milliseconds and then ensure it doesn't get depleted, how about just doing it, like put it on steroids and make sure that it gets refreshed every eight milliseconds, two milliseconds, or something like that. Well, the problem with that is that now, you increase the power consumption of your device incredibly because you're, you're using more power to refresh those capacitors and then you drain your battery of your phone instead of it lasting for, what is it, two hours? It'll be like 20 minutes. That's not really a viable solution. Plus, a lot of these memory stocks are actually supported. We're still looking for a good solution against raw hammer attacks. There are many partial ideas right there, but nobody's been able to string something together that's a really end all, except there's a particular provision in the DDR4 spec that has just come out a couple of months ago that says, hey, let's refresh the memory cells that are being used that are adjacent to the ones that are being hammered. So if you're hammering an address, the other ones are refreshed as well, which is a really good solution. But of course, we still have this legacy problem of all the memory since 2011 having problems. So this is the tale of the JavaScript code that owns your computer or can own your computer and it's without exploiting any software vulnerabilities or without taking advantage of something you did wrong. And so I thought this was something that you should at least be aware of. Thank you for watching.